because he, he is appointed as the ruler, as the one who owns the inheritance, who can take over the inheritance of everything in the universe. Uh, we covered that. And then also the son is described as the one who is the, uh, the creator of all the worlds. So that's important to understand. So the worlds is described here as the universe itself. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. So in other words, which might be a surprise to you, there's more than one world, okay? So it's not just the earth, it's worlds. So in other words, there are uh, stars or planets, or if people don't like the word planet, then stars, but either way, I don't care. But the point is, is that however way you want to word it, there are worlds out there in our universe where there can be population, there can be inhabitants. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do, appo which do appear. So all of creation, we have to understand this, all of creation here composes of many different worlds. So it's not just one world or the earth. All of creation consists of different worlds with different inhabitants. Which means then that there are aliens. So there are two applications for this one. If all of creation consists worlds, worlds, when you look it up in the dictionary, it has to do with inhabitants living on a planet. If you don't like that word, then you can call it star. I don't care, right? But the point is, that there are different inhabitants or dwellers. Uh, let's put D here. So it's not just earth dwellers. These are planet or star dwellers. Uh, dwellers of just put quote unquote planet, all right? Flat earthers, please don't get offended, all right? I just put it in quotes, okay? If you don't believe the word planet. By the way, the King James Bible says the word planet, okay? So I'll just use it for the term of that sake. If you want to see it as a star or a traveling star, fine, I don't care, all right? I'm just going to do it that way for simplicity's sake. Okay, so then creation consists of worlds, which is dwellers of a certain planet. So a twofold application then. Twofold application is as follows then. One is that these are referring to aliens, so then they can live on different planets. And then when I say planets, again, I'm using that in quotes, okay? So these are aliens out there. The second application could be referring to the timeline of beginning to future, which is what you see in this whiteboard. So the beginning, which is pre-Adamic, and then during the Adamic era and Noah's timeline, there's, uh, uh, they went through a flood. But this is actually referring to the universal flood that drowned out the world, and then we're now in our current world. In other words, then, when it says world, uh, uh, from the past timeline to the future. So if you go from the past timeline to the future, when Christ created worlds, we see that in the beginning timeline, it's a pre-Adamic era. The second timeline is our current era, which is our current human being, human population. Third timeline is the future when the saints of God will populate and spread throughout outer space, actually. Okay, so we see right here that the second application could be referring to uh, basically the three... Uh, how should I call it? The three earth ages. Let's call it that way. So let's cover uh, each of these numbers here, all right? First of all, aliens. Are there aliens that can dwell out in outer space? Absolutely go to Revelation chapter uh, 12. Revelation chapter 12. That's why the, they see UFOs. They see strange stuff in outer space. That's why even so-called truthers, they'll claim that 
when they've talked to astronauts, even uh, the famous Alex Jones, he claimed that when he talk, talked to, I think it was Buzz Aldrin or one of those famous astronauts, he mentioned that they did literally land on the moon, but over there they saw like pyramids and weird stuff, all right? I've heard reports where they saw water, caves, and just really weird stuff. But uh, whether that be true or false, the point is, is that there are reports. There are reports that uh, from people who did went out there or who was examining the universe that they can see some kind of uh, living activity. Living activity. If you want to call it aliens, fine. But the Bible is very plain that there is, quote unquote, aliens or life in outer space. There are these dwellers here. Notice Revelation chapter 12, 12, uh, the Bible says, verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew, notice right here, the third part of the stars of heaven. So he's drawing in the stars or planets with him, Satan. The stars or planets, actually, you'll notice is referring to the fallen angels. Uh, look at verse... 9, verse 9, and the great uh, dragon, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So notice right here that this is referring to those fallen angels that he drew. So these are the uh, one-third of the stars uh, that he drew and that was cast down to the earth. At Revelation 12, 4, third part of stars cast down to the earth. Verse 9, third part of the angels cast down to the earth. All right, so this is all matching up together. All right, now we're going to look at 2 Peter, uh, Peter 3. Notice 2 Peter 3 tells you three different ages of the earth. That's important to notice right here. The book of 2 Peter covers three different ages of the earth and the universe. So this is not Noah's flood, what you're going to be reading. This is talking about the context of the universe itself, the entire universe. Okay, so look at 2 Peter chapter 3. And then I want you to go to Genesis 1, all right? Genesis 1. Now, I'm not going to go thoroughly on the Genesis gap, but basically that teaching is that before Adam and Eve... Uh, there were beings, which we believe is Lucifer and his minions. They lived on the earth and they lived throughout the universe. However, because they sinned against God, uh, the Lord drowned them out with a universal flood. So you'll notice that right here, pre-Adamic. That's their era. But because they sinned, the Lord had to send a universal flood. After that flood... Then he cleared it out and then started the six days of creation. He started the six days of creation with mankind here. So the proof of it, so keep your hand at Genesis 1. Now look at Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the what? Water. So notice right here, after God created the earth and the heaven. So this is all, the, uh, so notice right here, God created the earth and the heaven, and then all of a sudden, in verse 2, waters covered everything. You see that? So all of a sudden, waters just covered everything. That's not a sign of creation, that's a sign of destruction. So verse 1, after God created it, verse 2, something bad happened. So 2 Peter 3 covers it. Look at verse 4, 2 Peter 3, verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the what? The beginning of the creation. Remember Genesis 1, 1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All of a sudden, there's waters everywhere, right? A universal flood, correct? Okay, look at how it matches perfectly with 2 Peter 3, 4, and 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. See that? So notice right here, the heavens, plural. That's universal. That's right. All right? That's right? So not just one heaven, but heavens. And then the earth covered by water. Verse 6, whereby the world, 
that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So notice right here that the heavens were changed. The whole universe was changed yep. by this flood. So it's not just a worldwide flood. This is referring to a universal flood that covered not the world and the heavens itself. But the context is no doubt universal. The context is not referring to Noah's flood because look at verse 8. Continuing on, uh, let's see. Uh, actually, uh, verse 12, verse 12, let's skip down, verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. See, that's future, right? In the future wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Remember the Bible says that I saw a new heaven and a new earth at the future at the book of Revelation? Why? That's universal. See, God's going to produce a new creation. He disintegrates all of the old creation uh, after the tribulation timeline and then starts a brand new creation for eternity. So if this part, verse 12 and 13, is universal, why do we make verse 5, 6, 7 just earthly, not universal? See, uh, context, it should follow context. So to be consistent with context, the, uh, the whole idea is a universe, the universe. It's not just the earth. So, again, the universe itself, under Lucifer and the fallen beings, so they were the ones who used to live here, and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, they sinned against the Lord, they rebelled, they followed the devil, and then after that, the Lord, he decided to drown them all out, 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7. The context here is no doubt uh, the beginning of creation, correct? So 4 through 5, this is not Noah's flood. This is not referring to Genesis 6. This is Genesis 1, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, not Genesis 6. The clue is, remember, beginning of creation. That's the timeline. By the way, Noah is not mentioned one time. Did you notice that in that whole chapter? You would think that an important person like that would be mentioned. Not mentioned at all. So it must be talking about a different idea. That's a different timeline right here. Beginning of creation itself. Then we see this universal flood that drowned it out. Notice that the Bible called it world, right? So it shows that there were dwellers living in it. There were dwellers living in it. Again, we see that. So there has to be pre-Adamic beings. That's the idea, pre-Adamic dwellers. Pre-Adamic means before Adam. The current world we see right here is Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. That is the six days of creation, all the way to what we see in Revelation chapter 21. And if you look at Revelation 21, 1 and 2, that's where God says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So this is our current earth. So we're living in it. And it will go on till through the apocalypse to the end of the apocalypse. God destroys everything and starts a brand new universe. Okay, now that we understand, let's return. <clears throat> let's go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. So if there's going to be uh, an if there's going to be a world for eternity, then that shows uh, there's going to be uh, people living in it, or there's going to be dwellers living in it. So notice right here, inhabitants of different planets, right? Inhabitants of different planets. That's what's going to happen in the future. So they will spread out throughout the universe. So what you see in Star Trek and Star Wars I mean, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, where do they get those ideas from? 
The Bible has always been uh, way ahead of them. You might say, why would that be the case? Because if angels live throughout the universe, and we've seen that, right? I mean, the Christians, they're going to be like the angels of heaven, right? So it makes sense they would do the same thing too. But let me show you one verse, okay, just in case. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not going to talk about populating outer space. That's a whole different teaching, all right? I've taught that in our Revelation class before, which was interesting. But uh, if anyone's interested in that, go to Revelation chapter 22 commentary, and it'll tell you stuff about that. It also tells you that from that tree of life, they have to go by, believe it or not, they would have to go by the zodiac, and then they have to take it at a certain season, the fruit, all right, to continue, and then spread population. But anyway, that's a whole different story. If you think I'm crazy, uh, before you make your judgment, look at the commentary and study the Bible yourself as I give verse by verse, all right? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll just give one verse though, okay? Now this is referring uh, to our rapture, right? It says in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is uh, raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So we will, uh, excuse me, we're going to be uh, receiving at the rapture resurrected bodies, right? Now look what it's described right here. Notice in verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. How about that? So there are bodies there living in the heavens. See that? Celestial. All right, so that plainly shows dwellers out there in the heavens versus terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Look at this. Planet by planet, these bodies that we're going to receive, okay? There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Told you so. So the resurrected bodies that we receive, it's going to go by different planets. We see, you see that? We go by those, their glories. All right, let's go back, Hebrews 1. Fascinating, right? Yeah. Very fascinating. Hebrews chapter 1. What the scientists and the, uh, theoretical uh, physicists, people who get into relativity, string theory, cosmologists, etc. I mean, these guys, they didn't even scratch the surface. I mean, they, don't, they can't tell you what's out there. God already had it all planned out, and He's given you an idea of it in His book. You just need to look at His book. All right, um, we're going to look at verse 3 now. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So again, you can see how verse 3 is continuing the description of Jesus Christ of the Son at verse 2. So we're going to go through one at a time here. So Jesus Christ is described as being, one, the brightness of His glory. So Jesus Christ, that's self-explanatory. He has His glory that's very bright. And then notice the next part, He has a specific image of His own person. So Jesus Christ, hear this, is His own person and has His own specific image. Okay. I want you to go to, man, hopefully I won't ruin the camera. Okay. I want you to go to Hebrews, uh, the Genesis, excuse me, chapter 1. All right. Genesis chapter 1. Great. Okay. And then I want you to go to Malachi 1. Malachi 1. All right. So uh, this way, right? Good? All right, then. So that's good enough? All right, then. Oh, thank God. All right. All right, go to Genesis 1, and then we'll go to uh, Malachi chapter 1. So Jesus Christ, again, has his own person. Do you see that? That's very important. There's a lot of people who deny the doctrine of the Trinity. That's heresy. You want to avoid those guys, okay? There are even people, believe it or not, who are King James only people that are falling for an anti-Trinitarian uh, belief. You better watch out for those guys. They can be kooks. They can be cultists, okay? Better watch out for those guys. 
see them teaching that on their channel, unsubscribe from them. Don't watch them anymore, okay? Because this even deviates from even mainstream Christianity. So they're not just teaching wrong doctrine. They're teaching something pretty cultic. So you want to avoid them. Now, the ones who will agree with those kooks are obviously Jehovah's Witnesses and then Mormons. And then they're just in very good company with other cults. So you, you don't want to follow along that same train. The Son has his own person. There are people out there who deny three persons in one God. It doesn't make sense logically to them. You'll see Muslims constantly arguing that one. Uh, but the simple answer is that uh, God, he can be 50,000 persons if he wants to, one person or three persons, it don't matter. God is God. God is everywhere. Can your human brain wrap around that one? See, that's really dumb and stupid. So for them to say, it doesn't make th sense three persons equal one God. It also don't make sense that God lives in everybody's heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, they're really dumb. Okay, because we're talking about a spiritual plane, not a physical plane. Okay, to put a person at a physical plane, third dimensional field, you're very limited. You limit God, all right? His persons, you got to realize, is in a spiritual plane right here. In that spiritual plane, he can do whatever he wants. All right, now, um, when we come to uh, three persons and one God, the Son, notice Hebrews 1, verse 3, what did it say? His, the express image of his person, right? His person. Is that what it said? Yeah. So the Son has his own person. Oh, so then notice that Jesus Christ is a person. So then if Jesus is God and he has his own person, what does that mean then? See, that means then it's either one third of a person or it means truly one person, and then this one's going to be another person, that one's another person. So Jesus Christ is his own person. So it proves right here that the Trinity has their own persons in there. Their own persons in there. Uh, they like to argue, no, it's not persons, it's parts. Or, you know, they'll say body, soul, and spirit, or whatever. Look, uh, whatever you want to uh, do wording on it, it don't matter. The point is, is that they do have their own persons too, okay? I'm not going to be nitpicky like the st stupid Catholic council that actually, if you study church history, they were arguing stupid stuff over the Trinity. And that happened three years ago online when they were all in a ruckus. It was so stupid, they wanted me to also join in the circus. I did not want to join the circus. That was one, you know why? They're repeating what the Catholic Council did. So if you see a bunch of these idiotic, quote unquote, onliners posting tons of video about the, uh, about the Trinity and then semantics and terms like that, calling each other heretics and stuff like that, they all acted like the Catholic Council that time. They were arguing over semantics about this. It is so stupid, all right? It is incredibly stupid. Like, when did Jesus give up his deity when he died on the cross? Was he fully man and fully God at the same time? Or did he lose his deity that time when he was at Calvary? And then how does the Trinity work? Is it three parts or is it three persons and, and three, uh, three persons but one entity? And just shut up, man. It's so silly, man, all right? So who, care, who cares about semantics? The point is we got to go by what the Bible says, right? All right, so the Bible, when you go by semantics, parts, and stuff like that, it don't really matter. You can go either or, all right? But the biblical thing, there is no doubt Jesus is God, Holy Ghost is God, Father is God. That is biblical. That is biblical semantics and terms. And also they have their own person too, all right? Now... Look at Genesis chapter 1. All right, Genesis chapter 1. Now notice right here the classic passage in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So notice right here that God said, he himself said us, correct? So notice right here that God, and that means also us. 
Some people will say those are referring to the angels or the other angelic beings or the host of heaven and etc. But uh, no, notice right here, read the word as says, God said, let us. All right, not all of heaven said, let us. God said, let us. By the way, if you want to insist this is referring to angels or other people, then you're giving the credit of the whole universe not being created by God, but by multiple what? Heavenly beings or gods or a pantheon? Okay, so now go to Malachi 1. So God said us, right? When you say us, that means persons. And I'm reading from the King James Bible wording itself, all right? Go to Malachi chapter 1. Notice that this is referring to persons. Look at verse 9. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto what? Us. All right. Who is us referred to as? Us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your what? Persons. Oh, is that what it said? So persons is us. All right. We're done. Let's move on. Why do we have to go endless stupid videos on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and then, you know, Instagram about semantics on the Trinity like a bunch of Catholic idiots going on that Council of Nicaea and other councils? Ridiculous, man. Arguing over that, and they were hardly arguing over the, one of the most important doctrines, which is salvation. Salvation was crucial. These guys weren't soul winners. Look at, what, look, look at those vadois and other people during those early centuries. Those guys were going everywhere spreading the word of God while a bunch of Catholic idiots getting into books were arguing over semantics. You know, that's like if I were to die, I would like my church to be soul winner spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ rather than arguing semantics about Gene Kim. What is he? Does he have three parts, you know? Is he really a Korean, you know? I heard he was part Jew, and, you know, that's like arguing over stupid stuff like that, all right? That is the most stupid thing, man. Souls dying and burning in hell is far more important than, you know, certain little parts or, you know, aspects and, like, you know, which fingernail does Gene Kim ha have or the color of his hair and weird stuff, man. Weird, all right. Can anyone figure out God anyways? Yeah, no way, all right? Can anyone figure out God? You're wasting your time. All right, go back, all right? You spend better time finding the date of the rapture, all right? If that's controversial, fine, all right? But you spend better time on that one than arguing about the color of God's hair and his toenail and other parts about him, you know? It's ridiculous, man, all right? Especially if God likes to keep himself hidden, right? His face, he has that tendency, all right? Let's go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. The verse says, the next part, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So Jesus Christ is described as a person who holds everything in the universe by his power, by the word of his power. When he says something, I mean, all of creation itself ties to that. It's held together by it. By his word. Uh, look at John 1. John 1 and Colossians 1. John 1 and Colossians 1. Now in some teachings, I would like uh, critique or question gravity or connect something negative to it. But um, me, I'm still, I still have no position on that one. If people believe in gravity, fine. If people don't, fine. Whatever. I don't care. But the point is, if uh, gravity were true, that everything is held together because of gravity, then what we would know is it's the word of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that holds it together. Now, gravity is supposedly consists of vibrations itself. Now, word come out through what? Vibrations. See? So scientists like to call it gravity. I like to call it the Word of God. Look at John chapter 1 and then verse 1. In the beginning was the what? Word. Word. Okay, and verse 3. All things were made by Him, the Word. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Word created all the universe. And the, wor and the Word is the one that keeps it all together. All right, go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verse 16, verse 16. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So that's the universe. Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were, were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him, what? All things, all things consist. You know what that means? All things are held together. Scientists have always wondered how this whole universe can be held together. They call it gravity, but we Bible believers call it, it's the word of God. All right, go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We'll look at verse uh, 3 again. When he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ, by his own actions, purged. Okay, that means, I mean, he cleared it off. He cleared it off. He, uh, he cleansed away our sins. And then he sat down. Once he cleansed away our sins, we know this, he went back up to heaven, and he's sitting down on the right hand of the majesty, so that's God himself, the Father, his majesty on high, so he's on high. Uh, we look at Acts chapter uh, 7, Acts chapter 7, so Jesus Christ is sitting, not standing, correct? When you're a ruler, think about this, if you're in front of a king, you're in front of a ruler, and then the king and the ruler is sitting on his throne, that would be the norm, right? If the king uh, stands up, that is abnormal, right? That's unusual. That means if you see a king sitting, you're like, okay, so he's doing his usual thing. But if the king all of a sudden starts to get up from his throne, you know that, oh, something's about to happen, right? So think about this, if Jesus Christ is currently sitting on his throne, and he's about to get up, what's the natural thing to think about? He's about to do something. Yeah. He's no longer sitting on the throne. He's going to do something. Yeah. He's about to leave the throne to where? Yeah. Why, you know, to yeah. da -da, he's going to rapture us. Yeah. Now, notice this similar situation happened at Acts 7. So the so Acts 7, these Jews could have received their rapture if they received Jesus, their Messiah, actually. So look at uh, Acts chapter 7. Notice when Stephen was preaching, he said this at verse 56. 56. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Oh, so Stephen said he sees Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God, not sitting. That means the king's about to leave the throne and do something. Rapture. But then uh, we do know this is that Jesus Christ never did the rapture for the Jews. And you can guess why. It's because they rejected. So look at verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So why would Stephen say, oh, Lord, uh, please uh, don't, lay, don't take this sin, the action that they do to their charge? Why would he say that? Unless maybe he saw Jesus Christ was about to rapture the Jews. But then here these Jews rejected their Messiah and stoned Stephen. And Stephen's like, don't let that delay the rapture. You know, don't keep their sin in their mind. Just rapture us, please. Now, remember, uh, I've shown you this passage before. But if you go to Acts 3, uh, we've done this last Hebrew study, so I'll do it again. Acts 3. But remember this. If you remember this, uh, this is called the postponement theory, okay? So in the postponement theory, you might recall that Jesus Christ, after he died on the cross, the, the preaching was first given not to the Gentiles, but to Jews, correct? Since it was given to the Jews, the Jews were given a chance. Now remember, when the Jews rejected, they had to turn to Gentiles, correct? 
So notice that the Jews received their chance. They were receiving a chance here. But because the Jews rejected their chance, that's the reason why God had to uh, switch to the Gentiles here. So here, are, here we are, the Gentiles, times of Gentiles. Now, if a Jew wants to get saved, we do know this, he's not, gonna, uh, he's not going to get saved by his law, by God's dealing with the Jews. He's going to have to go the Gentile way, right? How do Jews get saved? Normally by Gentiles, right? So he's going to have to get saved the Gentile way. That's why we got Gentile churches, correct? And then Jews who attend Gentile churches. Gentiles are the one responsible for spreading Christianity, uh, not the Jews. They rejected their Messiah. So the times of Gentiles, also known as church age. Before they can switch to the Gentiles, God was still dealing with the Jews during the timeline of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, those Jews, they kept rejecting, rejecting, rejecting. So because they rejected, God had to turn to the Gentiles, and then the rapture has been postponed for about 2,000 years now. So, so 2,000 years have passed, and we're waiting for that rapture to hit. Let me switch it this way. We're going up, not down. Amen? So <laughs> let me switch it that way. So if the rapture were to hit that time, it could have happened here. Is that what you're saying, Pastor? Yes, it could have happened here. This could have been that timeline for the rapture if the Jews received their Messiah. We see that at Acts chapter 7. Jesus was about to do something. Acts chapter 3 is evidence that the Jews, they were anticipating for Jesus Christ to come bring in the messianic kingdom. All right? So we saw that before. I'm not going to read it, but if you read Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 and 21, see that? Peter was telling them, Jesus is coming. He's going to receive you. Uh, restart the messianic kingdom, the Jewish dealings. So God was going to do that, but because the Jews rejected it, God's no longer by, going by Jewish dealings, but Gentile dealings. This is a teaching called dispensationalism. That's the reason why we strongly believe in dispensationalism. It makes all the verses sense why God did what he did, how God's dealings and the Holy Spirit's dealing move that way. Dispensationalism resolves everything. It has to do with that Jew and Gentile. So the Jews, they rejected it, and because of that, the Lord couldn't do the rapture with them, and then he switched it. So from Jews, he switched it to Gentiles, okay? So this is actually called the postponement theory. Postponement theory. But to me, I don't believe it's a theory. I believe it's a fact, actually. But Clarence Larkin, in his book, Dispensational Truth, gives a lot of interesting stuff about the postponement theory. So you can look at that one. Okay. Let's go back to Hebrews. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance attain, obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, remember, I'll be explaining each and every word, so see how the explanation matches every word in the verse. So Jesus Christ is being described again. He's saying that he's made so much better than the angels. Why is he uh, made better than the angels? Because... Uh, by inheritance, he inherited something. A son or is usually the heir, right? If you look at verse 2, Jesus Christ is appointed heir, correct? And he's also known as a son at verse 2, correct? So a son is the heir who gains the inheritance. So because of his inheritance, he's better than all the other angelic beings. Jesus Christ is very different. 
he obtained a more excellent name than they. So because of that inheritance that he was able to receive, he has a more excellent reputation, a more excellent name than all those angels. As a matter of fact, if you look at your Bible, uh, not many angels are known, but Catholics sure like to make a big deal on those saints or names or angels, right? right. But not God. Not God. He wants Jesus. Yes. Only the Catholic Church would make a big deal about, uh, you know, Michelangelo and Raphael and all the Ninja Turtle names of the saints and the <laughs> angelic beings, right? So they always make a big deal on that. God never mentions too much about it. He just says Michael and Gabriel, to my knowledge, yeah. The reason why is because God wants Jesus Christ to obtain a more excellent name than they. That's right. So then when you go to the Catholic churches, you got to question and ask yourself, why would they try to elevate these angelic names, you know, Mary and saints' names? Right. No, God wants it concentrated on Jesus Christ. All right. Now, when we go to verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So unto any of the angels, when did the Father ever said at any time, uh, you are my son, at this day I gave birth to you. So God never said that to any angel. He only said that to Jesus Christ. Now, uh, to cover uh, some heresies over here, some people will use uh, verse 4 that Jesus Christ is made, right? And also born from the Father at verse 5 sometime at eternity. So then they'll claim Jesus is a created God. That's what they would like to uh, claim. But that's not what it's pointing out right here. What it's pointing out right here is referring when Jesus Christ was born into this world. When Jesus Christ was born into this world, he became, uh, he became known and he was recognized as the son of the father or the begotten son of the father. Because when was Jesus Christ born? Obviously not in eternity. He was born at, uh, later on uh, during his timeline at the, when he died on the cross, correct? Right. So that's when Jesus Christ was born. So then when you're looking at made or begotten, the context would refer to his birth on the earth. It's not referring to being a created God or being. Now, uh, some people, what they would like to do is, this is where you're going to have to follow semantics with me, okay? So, Garner Ted Armstrong teaches, and unfortunately, even Calvinists unknowingly teach that. They follow Garner Ted Armstrong's teaching. And I think Joyce Meyer even teaches the same thing. But basically, when God says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten you, uh, there are several heresies to uh, beware of. One is the one I already covered about being a created God from eternity. The other one is uh, they would argue that uh, his eternal sonship. So in other words, Jesus Christ was the son ever since from eternity. He was begotten from eternity. How do you give birth from eternity? You know? That don't make sense, obviously. Giving birth is when you start life. So that's the opposite of eternity. So the council actually had a big debate about that one in the early centuries, and then they just went nowhere because, like I told you before, the Catholic council's problem was always arguing stupid semantics. Yeah. So then they just came to the conclusion about something like he was eternally begotten. You know, it's just so hilarious. Um, so then, now I'm not going to be nitpicky. Sometimes maybe uh, he, was, uh, he can receive that title as son, uh, before his birth. I can go along with that one. Uh, like Daniel chapter 4 indicates that, I think. It would indicate it. If not, then it's not. I'm wrong. But the point is, is that I'm not going to be nitpicky about this. So what I am nitpicky about so that people don't misunderstand me is not the semantic of son, but rather that they argue that he was eternally begotten. So he was, that one is actually incorrect. And that is very dangerous. Uh, I believe that his begotten is simply what the Bible says. It's pointed out when he was born, when he was literally begotten on this earth, not sometime in eternity. So that's the second uh, heresy to avoid. The third heresy to avoid is where Garner Ted Armstrong argues. So this is his teaching, okay? His teaching would be that when Jesus was begotten was at the resurrection, 
So they claim that when Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead, that's when God said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now I'm going to debunk all those heretical teachings and then we'll call it a night, okay? So I want, this is where we get into a little bit of apologetics and I want you to follow along with me. All right, first things first, let's debunk the heresy. The day is important, right? So notice it says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So what does that mean? So that don't mean eternity. So you know what they call it? The, the, the silly Catholic councils, just like the Calvinists. They always go by semantics rather than what it says, all right? So it was some kind of eternal day. Stop. Just stop, man. Don't embarrass yourself, all right? Don't embarrass yourself, these people. Ah. So either we go by what the Bible says or we go by semantics, all right? What would you and I want to go for? Because if you want to go by semantics, fine. Because we PhD scholars can go all day long on semantics and we'll never get anywhere. And semantics are unscriptural too, all right? It's better and more reliable to go by what the Bible says. So if it says, this day have I begotten you, then we can literally take it that it was that day that Jesus Christ was born. But you want better proof? Here's a, what are they going to do with this one? The next part of verse 5. And again, I, what? That's a timeline, right? That's not eternal. That's what? Future. So it's a prophecy about the future. I, God the Father, will be to him, Jesus Christ, a father. So God the Father will be a father to Jesus the Son, and he, Jesus, shall, future, to me, be to me a son. When did that take place, huh? At an eternal begotten day. Stop. All right? It makes more sense. This is a prophecy that God was speaking from the Scripture that, um, that one, t one day Jesus Christ will be born. And it's at that day. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten you. All right? Unless you want to play semantics, you want me to be a Calvinist? Fine, I'll be a Calvinist. This future will could be an eternal will. See, anyone can throw in stuff. By the way, that was just a joke. But I, but I wouldn't be surprised some nitwit scholar out there might take my logic and take it seriously and teach that. I just threw that out of my rear end, you know, so then... It's really funny how scholars talk nowadays. Now, uh, why, why are you so mean and hard on scholars, Pastor? Because they brainwash the people because people think as long as you're a scholar or a PhD and you talk smart with semantics, I believe you. I hate that. I hate that. You cannot do that. You got to di be dictated by the word of God. God finds that disgusting as well when you go by uh, higher ed as your final authority. He hates that. The Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. That shows how much he belittles the wisdom of men. He says, my foolishness is far better. So, and the Bible says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. See that? So my foolish talk that you don't like, God considers that to be better than the higher ed floundry and then the, the niceties and the semantics and the intellectual talk of what you hear from your proper theologians nowadays. So keep that in mind. All right. Anyways, so let's debate uh, this passage again. Now let's go to Garner Ted Armstrong's passage at Acts 13, okay? So this is his proof text that when Jesus Christ was resurrected, that was when uh, God begotten Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts 13:33. And that's where Joyce Meyer comes in about Jesus Christ being the first person that was born again. <laughs> so they teach that because Jesus Christ was the first person that was a born again saved Christian. That's the reason why all of us can be born again and saved Christians too. <laughs> that's ridiculous, man. That's ridiculous. But let's look at Acts chapter 13 and verse 33. God fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up Jesus again as it is also written in the second Psalm. So when God raised up Jesus, see, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Oh, we're in trouble, all right? 
Close your Bibles. Let's join Garner Ted Armstrong's church, all right? Now, here's the idea, okay? It's simple. You got to read the entire context, correct? All right, what is the entire context? The entire context, this is important. The whole topic is not the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that again. What Paul was preaching in Acts 13 is not the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's talking about the whole life of Jesus Christ. His birth, death, burial, and resurrection. Now you might say, why is that important? Because if this is the whole topic that Paul was talking about over here, then he's using multiple verse passages that would talk about his birth, his life, or his death, and his resurrection. He's not using every verse just on his resurrection. That's right. Now, do you want proof? Here's the proof. One is verse 34. Notice, why did he say, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this why, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. See that? Why is it that Paul said at verse 34, concerning the topic of the resurrection, here's the Bible verse. Yeah, come on. He didn't do that at verse 33. If verse 33, use your head now. If verse 33, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That was talking about the resurrection why would he all of a sudden say at verse 34, and concerning about the resurrection? Here's a Bible verse. See, that don't make sense. So then why would he use this passage? Because look at verse 32, the context. The context is Jesus being born to the children of Israel. Okay, look at verse 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the what? Okay, there's a promise made to the Israel forefathers. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children. So God made sure that it would come to pass that from their children, from their genealogy, their line, there would be someone uh, that God would raise up Jesus from the dead. So raising Jesus from the dead is not what the verse is referring to, but raising up Jesus from the dead is simply identifying the one who came from that lineage, that line of the Jews. Do you understand that? Yeah. So it's just simply identifying Jesus. That's all it is. Yeah. Then what is thou art my son this day have I begotten thee? Simple, what we've always figured out. Jesus' birth yeah. from the line of Israel. Because how do we know that? He said, verse 32, the promise which was made unto the Father, God hath what? Fulfilled. He made sure that it would be fulfilled. What? In the scripture. So the scripture must be fulfilled the same unto us, their children, through their lineage, their line. So he's introducing Jesus. All right? He has to identify who Jesus is. The one who is Jesus. The one who comes from your line unto us, their children. See that? Unto us, their children, who raised himself from the dead. So he had to identify him. See? Uh, let me continue on. In that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. See that? And then concerning his resurrection, verse 34. See? And then concerning his resurrection... And then verse 35, he talks about the verse for the resurrection. See that? So a lot of people don't look at that. So one right here, unto us their children, fulfilled, right? So he has to quote a scripture that would fulfill this. What is the scripture that's being fulfilled that someone is from their lineage, their line? Right here, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Jesus born to the children of Israel. That's what it means. Not Jesus raising himself from the dead. No, Jesus, or you can write here, Jesus who raised himself from the dead, born to the children of Israel. You can do that too, all right? That's fine. But that's what it's talking about. It's not talking about his resurrection here. It's, it's identifying 
who he is, where he came from, his lineage. Number two, concerning him, uh, concerning him who raised him from the dead, that proves that this shows a separation from thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So these are the two things to understand. That's why I wanted you to have your thinking caps on, follow along. I hope that made it simple for you to understand. Okay, now uh, let's go to Hebrews 1. I have about three minutes, and I think I can do all this in three minutes, okay? Now, here are the verses, and I'll write them again in our next Hebrew study, all right? But uh, if the Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews, personally, I think that he is. If I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. That's okay, all right? But he's quoting all these verses in Hebrews, and he's quoting from the book of Psalm and one in 2 Samuel. So if you're wondering what scriptures the author of Hebrews is quoting, he is quoting from these passages. So then if you want to know what they are, you can write those verses down, okay? So here's the idea. Verse 5a, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's Psalm 2, verse 7, all right? That's Psalm 2, verse 7. The next scripture that he's quoting and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That is from 2 Samuel 7, 14. Then verse 6, again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. So let all the angels of God worship him, Psalm 97, 7. Verse 7, of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, that one is Psalm 104, 4. Verse 8, the part where it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever. Uh, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. That is Psalm 45, 6, verse 9. How hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity? Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's Psalm 45, 7. All right, let me finish uh, explaining every word in verse 5, and then we'll call it a night. All right, uh, the last part of verse 5, I didn't explain every word on that one. And again, so he's quoting another scripture. That's what he's about to do. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So the, God the Father will be to Jesus Christ as a father, and then Jesus Christ will be a son to the father. Go to 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7. So basically, the whole context of the author is why Jesus Christ is much better. Why? Because he never said this to any angel. You know, hey, you're going to be to me a son and I'll be to you a father. Uh, you are my son, this day have I begotten you, right? Uh, go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse 14. Now, this is very important. This proves uh, double application in Scripture, dispensational application. So remember, Hebrews, I told you before, it's a book that must have double application, correct? What does that mean? One verse could be divided into two different time periods or two different applications. It could be two different time periods. One could be an Old Testament time period. The other one could be at a New Testament time period. One could be a practical application. The other one could be a doctrinal application, et cetera, et cetera. So that's important in Hebrews. I've taught you that. That is indisputable. The evidence to prove double application is 2 Samuel 7, 14. This is God speaking to David about his son Solomon, not Jesus. 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Okay, this is no doubt Solomon. God says, I'll be his father, and he, Solomon's going to be my son. If Solomon sins, I'm going to punish him. All right. But the author of Hebrews pointed out that the first half of this verse, just the first half, is Jesus Christ, not Solomon. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. The second half is not Jesus. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. That ain't Jesus. Jesus ain't being punished for his sins. So we see right here that this is referring. So notice a verse is cut in half. One to one time period, another one to another time period. Backwards too. Backwards. You see that? So verse 14 jumps to the future about Jesus. 
The second half of verse 14 is reverted back to Old Testament. If you don't do that with scripture, scriptural interpretation, you don't know your scripture. Single-mindedness interpretation is dangerous interpretation. Then you have to go by semantics. And you know how well that thing goes, all right? Anyone can pull it off from the fog of their brain, you know. In verse 14, you see an example of two time periods as well as, a doctrine, uh, as well as a doctrinal application and a historical application. So let me repeat this again. We see two cases of double application. One is two different time periods. The second is we see doctrinal application and historical application. Historical application is what? All of verse 14 is Solomon. That fits well with Solomon, right? All of verse 14 is historically about Solomon. But then God takes that first half of verse 14 where he was doctrinally seeing into the future that it would be Jesus Christ. Why do you think Solomon is a typology of Jesus at the Song of Solomon? See that? So you have to do that with Scripture, all right? It's so important to go by that. That's how the Lord interprets his word. When he speaks, here's an eye-opening thing, and then I'll close. When God speaks, he is I am that I am. That means all different nine realms of dimensions, and then all time periods. He's not bound by time. So when he gives one statement, it could apply God knows wherever. Do you understand that? Because he is everywhere, all time periods. That's why dispensationalism is hands down a must. It makes so much sense on biblical hermeneutics. If you don't go by that, then good luck. I am very interested to see their interpretation, and I'll be honest with you, buddy, they all don't jive. You might as well become an atheist, to be very honest. You can be atheist because you can interpret that verse however way you want. All right? This one makes the most sense right here is dispensationalism. You strictly go by the Bible, the text, what it says. Father God, I pray that uh, tonight's Hebrew teaching was a blessing to our people. Open their eyes more on their... A doctrinal understanding of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.